Well, hello, and welcome back to the Lamp Post Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we journey chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. This is chapter 12 of The Last Battle Through the Stable Door. This one sounds like an Avid Brothers song to me. <laughs> Do you want to sing it for us or Through no? the stable door. <laughs> I've always wanted there to be more singing, and I feel like we've now checked that off. Oh, good. Just in time. Just in time for the... uh, Well, we haven't told everybody, but season eight will be only song. (laughs) It's only in verse. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Just like the ancient classics. Oh, as they should be. Now, before we jump into chapter 12, I would like us to make just the slightest detour back to the voyage of the Dawn Shredder. You know, we've occasionally done this where we take a little bit of time at the beginning of an episode just to revisit something from the past. And I was recently reading uh, chapter 10 of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Our class is making our way through those adventures. And for listeners, if they've forgotten, or Phil, if you've forgotten, chapter 10 of Dawn Treader is in the magician's house. And that's where Lucy goes through the magician's book and she sees those spells. And at the very end of that chapter... She says the spell that makes invisible things visible, and we learn that Aslan was there all along. And it's, it's either right there at the end of that chapter or at the beginning of chapter 11, I can't remember, where Lucy, you know, kind of ex- explains that she's surprised that that spell would have worked on Aslan. And Aslan says, you know, don't you think I'd follow my own rules? Kind of, that was this was always a weird scene to me. I wasn't quite sure why these things applied. I was a little dumbfounded like Lucy was. Wait, isn't Aslan outside? There are no rules that apply to Aslan. How could any of these things work for him? He is the god of this story, and therefore there are no rules. Well, it, as it turns out, uh, Lewis was doing something remarkably profound here, and maybe our listeners already knew this. Maybe you'd already figured this out too, Phil, but it was new to me, so I will be humble enough to admit that. <laughs> and I was recently reading the second or third chapter of Problem of Pain, which is Divine Omnipotence. And in that chapter, Lewis is kind of explaining what it means for God to be omnipotent. And he talks about what it means for things to be impossible. And he writes in this chapter, in The Problem of Pain, that when we use the word impossible, we actually imply a suppressed clause beginning with the word unless. So he he gives this, this kind of metaphor, this example of, you know, you can say, well, I can't see that building unless I move. Or it's impossible for me to see this thing unless that building moves. And he goes on and he says these two very interesting things about God. He says, the, imp- the absolutely impossible may also be called the intrinsically impossible because it carries its impossibility within itself instead of borrowing it from other impossibilities, which in their turn depend upon others. It has no unless clause attached to it. It is impossible under all conditions and in all worlds and for all agents. So it's impossible for all, and that would include God. He then goes on to say this. It remains true that all things are possible with God. The intrinsic impossibilities are not things, but non-entities. It is no more possible for God than for the weakest of his creature to carry out both of two mutually exclusive alternatives, not because his power meets an obstacle, but because nonsense remains nonsense even when we talk it about God. I love this. Nonsense remains nonsense, right? He's saying this doesn't mean that God's power meets some kind of obstacle that makes something impossible. It's saying that this thing isn't a thing and therefore cannot be possible. And this idea might feel kind of foreign to you. Maybe It definitely feels foreign to me, or it did when I first encountered it. And I wonder if this is especially true for those of us who grow up in the church, you know, from a very young age, we're told that God can do all things. And we're, you know, we appropriately assume that that means that God can do all things. You know, it reminds me, I saw this hilarious mug once. I had a coworker years ago who this was like their their cup of uh, their mug they carried around the school. And it said, I can do all things through verses taken out of context. <laughs> <laughs> Take off your lid for these are holy grounds. <laughs> so I, I bring this up for for two reasons. And one, I simply think this is an interesting connection to the Dawn Treader. And I think that Lewis is trying to communicate something incredibly deep and complex in this simple scene between Lucy and Aslan, that they're are things that are impossible 
for Aslan here, just as there are actually things that are impossible for God. Now, secondly, though, I think that this, this idea will make even more sense, this idea that there are certain things Aslan cannot do, when we get to the next chapter, chapter 13 in the last battle. And so I wanted to simply bring this back, you know, into our minds as we prepare for our next chapter, which is about more, has more going on with the dwarves. We, we continue to see them into our next chapter. And some of what happens there I think comes back to this scene, this idea that there are things that are impossible for Aslan to do. Right. It also points out, I think there are limits to our language and lim- limits to our own minds too. And we can see that with our language, but there's all kinds of stuff that we are not going to fully understand. Well, Phil, let's, let's put this behind us and let's dive into chapter 12 here. Very interesting chapter. I know that you've probably got a lot going on in your mind as you see these seven friends of Narnia appear seemingly out of nowhere. Eustace and Jill are somehow with them, despite the fact that they also should be in Narnia. Are we still in Narnia? I don't know. Everybody got a wardrobe refresh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's... Do you want to go ahead and do the chapter summary? Sure. Take it away, sir. Eustace is thrown through the stable door before Tyrion and the Unicorn can rescue him from the Chloramon army. The dwarves fire a series of arrows, but instead of aiming at the Narnians, they attack the soldiers. With little success. The dwarves are soon captured and tossed one by one into the doorway as an offering to Tash. One last battle begins, and in the middle of the fight, Tyrion grabs Rishta and jumps through the doorway. Tash is there on the other side, and a voice calls out telling him to take his prey. And when he leaves with Rishda in tow, Tyrion sees seven familiar faces and realizes that he is with some, but not all, of the former kings and queens of Narnia. All right. Wow, some great... Let's just talk with these illustrations first before we dive into anything else. We've get two of my favorite. Throughout the entire Chronicles, we get the seven friends of Narnia greeting Tyrion at the end of the chapter, Lots of bright, vibrant colors in Baines' illustrations. And then we get Tash picking up Rishta. And my, oh my, that is a awesome, awesome work of art. It is incredibly epic. That's, that's, that's a really... In general, Tash might be my favorite depiction. The co- I mean, favorite's weird because it's a demon. But, mm. I mean, it's it's a pretty cool-looking demon. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. pretty awesome, you know? Um, I've always liked the design of the bad guys' characters more. And it, yeah. it's odd because you're you're dressing up as Darth Maul for Halloween. Did you dress up as Darth Maul? I, I did. I also dressed up as Spider-Man, so it kind of balanced out. That's fine. He's so good. But I have a Thanos... Uh, bobblehead what are the Funko, Funko, Funko Pop? and it's it's odd Thanos is a really bad guy but the design is so cool that's and I have a bunch of Darth Vader stuff I yeah, don't yeah. I'm not I don't look up to Darth Vader it's not a no good one's thing. like Luke's wearing a white t-shirt that's not as cool you know yeah like Darth Vader. he's wearing a, a bathroom <laughs> yeah and then you know the all the Jedi just are in monk robes so right. yeah <laughs> who who has cool bet what's the best costume in all of Star Wars do you think? Do you think that somebody comes to mind quickly? And so, if you're gonna skip, Darth, I can give you uh, Darth Vader's the coolest one because it's okay. a samurai mask with a Nazi helmet. That that's yeah, just I mean, yeah. so good. I really appreciated Kylo Ren's helmet design, especially for what it is in the first movie, and then it kind of got a little diluted when. They smashed it and then put it back together with <laughs> red. That red they're, they're even half, though it's a cool design, it's just the story attached to it is not. I as cool. I don't actually know this, but I I promise you that, and I'm not saying this would actually be good, but somewhere on the YouTube is is some 45 minute long video essay that looks at how Kylo Ren's mask is a metaphor for the three sequel movies, right? Like where, you know, it's like, it's mostly works really well together in the force awakens. And then it completely (laughs) gets destroyed as Ryan Johnson ruins the legacy of star Wars. Right. And then it tries to get patchwork back together by Abrams in rise of Skywalker, but it completely and utterly fails. And that's why the sequel trilogy is terrible. That, that, that video exists out there somewhere. (laughs) You can find anything you're looking for. (laughs) That's, that's the problem with the internet. (laughs) Um, 
I well, thought Grievous was a really cool design, and oh, Grievous, yeah, yeah. This was this never made it into the main movie, but I thought, uh, is it Ventress? Asajj Ventress. Asajj Ventress yeah. with two J's. That's a cool name and a cool character and a cool outfit and cool lightsabers. Have you watched the new? Um, what's the new TV show? Soka. You haven't watched that, have you? I haven't, I haven't, I haven't either. Nope. <laughs> let's let's go back to the beginning of this chapter, um, and let's talk about Jill here. Jill is seeing all of this occur. I love that we get this chapter from her perspective here with the final battle taking place. And um, within what, like you said, within what the first, in the third paragraph, we see Eustace flung into the stable door. And I guess I should go ahead and ask you, Phil, here at the beginning of the chapter, I mean, what happens to him when he's thrown in? We do not see him again for the rest of the chapter until this other appearance inside the stable, which very clearly is not in the... It's not a spoiler to acknowledge that it's not in the stable because those people weren't obviously in the stable. And it's very bright there. It, it, I mean, something else is weirdly happening here. Yeah. What, what happens to Eustace in this moment? I guess he gets teleported. And if Aslan can do anything, sure, he probably sent him through a wormhole and he picked up a new set of clothes on the way. I'm curious. I still don't fully understand. Is everybody dead at this point? Is this an afterlife mm -hmm. type thing? Is this a not a purgatory in the sense that we usually understand? Is this a holding pattern for them to go back somewhere? Are they at the gates of Aslan's country? I'm so curious. Yeah. But it really does seem like it is a one-way trip. Everyone reacts to this scene as if we have all watched Eustace die. Mm -hmm. Right? Like Jill there and Tyrion. And then when we hear from Jewel later on and uh and Farsight. Every I think it's Farsight that might make it say this, but or maybe it's it's Poggin. Everybody reacts as if like that's like Eustace is gone. Mm -hmm. Right? And then um I don't remember who it exactly is who says, oh, it's Poggin, who says, you know, a page or two later that all one by one we're going to pass through that dark door before the morning. I can think of a hundred deaths I would have rather have died. So, I mean, Poggin is like, this is death. Like, whatever's happening in there, that's the end. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is they have no idea what's on the other side of that, right? All they've known is people who go in there, we see bright light, and then they don't come back. Right. Right. So for all they know, you walk in there, Tash just eats you and it's over. Right. Maybe he's just wearing like one of those, um, like a, like a neon lobster light. bib. What, well, I, that, okay. That too. I was thinking of what were those little, uh, the, you would crack the little, uh, glow, glow, lights. glow sticks, glow sticks. That's maybe yeah. he's just wearing some of those, like a rave, you know, inside. Yeah. And that's where the lights coming from. <laughs> um, but it very much so. It, Tyrion even says it's like a mouth. Everybody reacts as if this is the end whenever you go through that. It's here in the morning over or the lack of morning they even get to do over Eustace that the the dwarves begin just shooting at all the Kalorman army. They shoot yeah. the entire Kalorman army here. Did you was this surprising to you or you're like, no, this is just on brand for who they've they've been this whole book? It really matches with their kind of approach to everything they just they're in it for themselves they want to they'll take out anybody who whoever's winning they'll they'll fire at them for a little bit yeah but I mean, it, stops, just, it stops being effective i'm really excited to dive more into them in the next chapter i don't know if you've looked but chapter 13 is how the dwarfs refuse to be taken in hmm. so we have even more to do with There's, these we'll get to go back and we're, we're not just done with narnia that's a good thing yeah well we'll definitely see more of the dwarves for sure. There's also an interesting line that I'll come back to later um, that Lewis writes, which says, whatever else you may say about dwarves, no one can say they aren't brave, which we'll come back to. At first, I read this as a compliment. You know, hey, you know, there are all kinds of things, but they're definitely brave. I'm now wondering if actually this is uh, not as much of a compliment as I originally thought that it was. But mm. I, I actually think it has to do a little bit with the the omission of Susan at the end of this chapter, which we'll talk a little bit about for sure. I'm really interested to see how that connects. What happens now, Phil, after, uh, after the dwarves attack and we start hearing from 
uh, Rish Datar Khan and the armies begin to regroup. So the dwarves have been shooting at them, but this time they're shooting at an army that is well prepared. They have armor, the arrows don't work as effectively, and they the tide kind of turns and they chase after the dwarves and then they come back and they're all tied up. Mm-hmm. And just one by one, they toss them all in. I imagine there's some more flashes of light. And then the dwarves are done. And then it's a matter of rounding up the rest of the Narnians. Mm-hmm. Rishta even calls out and says, hey, you know, the... Okay, I'm interested actually by this. So the children and Tyrion, they're like, y'all are, y'all are going to be offered to Tash. Like, y'all are going to die. Just, we're not taking prisoners for y'all. But we'll take the dogs. They'll go live in the Tizrox uh, kennels. We'll take the unicorn who's going to have his horn sawed off. And we'll take the boar to go live in the cage. But then, okay, so there's a kind of a clear distinction between the talking beasts and the humans. Mm-hmm. But then Farsight the eagle gets included with the children and the king. I'm, what did Farsight do? Do they just don't yeah. have a use for him there? They're like, all right, we could, you you know, Jewel can pull a cart. Uh, the boar can do s- stuff and so can the dogs. We, we don't need an eagle. Is that what's happening here? Yeah, a bad call. They should have. Use the eagle for something. Maybe you keep it on a long string. Yeah, <laughs> it's oh. a big one though because it's a talking beast, so it's larger than other eagles would be. Right, a big piece of string. I wonder if the thought is we can't control this bird, but I'm also curious if they think they can really take it out. It seems like Farsight could get away from this. Farsight just doesn't want to. I also wonder if okay, think of these other, the boar, the dogs. Although this was not true about Jewel though. Because Jewel was with Tyrion. The other ones were, were um, at some point, were convinced of Aslan's return through Puzzle. So maybe there's an idea of, hey, we could trick him again, whereas Farsight wasn't there. So maybe they're worried about that. But actually, this doesn't make sense, because mm-hmm. then why lump Jewel into that, too? It really, I, this would almost make more sense to have Farsight and maybe the rest of them be like, well, Jewel, we already know we can't convince, so throw Jewel over with the humans. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. I'm also curious if this is in the heat of the battle everybody's out of breath and they're not really thinking very clearly. Oh, and, oh and you someone, over there. Someone just pulls them them. aside and says, Hey man, how, how did you decide who's, who we're going to keep and who we're going to throw, throw away? Mm-hmm. I wasn't really thinking about yeah, it. I was, I was I was just, it sound, I thought it sounded stuff. good. It's something I heard in a battle when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, obviously the only answer that we get are growls and, What's interesting, though, is then Rishta says, all right, just kill all the beasts. We don't want them as prisoners anymore, but take the two-legged ones alive, obviously, so that they can uh, then they, they can then be sacrificed to Tash. And we then hear that it's the spears that make this battle so difficult, but that there's a lot of... Um, some of the Klorman army does not have spears, but through all of this we really just get a paragraph or two of Lewis describing kind of the heat of this battle, and it ends up with Tyrion facing off, right, against Rishta. Tell me more about what's happening there. I really enjoy how Tyrion realizes that this is not going very well, and he understands that they've been pushing him toward the doorway Mm -hmm. the entire time, and he accepts that that's where he's going. At the same time, he thinks, at least I'll take one of them with me yeah. if this is if this is so important to them i'm going to show them what it's like and he runs up he it doesn't i don't know if he realizes it's rishta until after it, the way it's told it seems like he doesn't but he just grabs somebody by the belt and jumps backwards pulling the, him with him and then once they're inside realizes that it's rishta he he brings in rishta with him says come in and meet tash yourself which is just a great action movie line right there. Yeah. And I love the fact that there's soldiers outside screaming, banging on the door, right? The the soldiers themselves don't want to meet Tash, right? There's also this interesting line I, that we skipped over that I actually want to just go back to for a quick second, which is that um, when the dwarves are thrown in to the stable, all of the... Um, the entire Kalorman army, they are screaming out for Tash. And Lewis puts in parentheses, there's no nonsense about Tashlin now. Yeah. Interesting. 
right? That they quickly return here to their kind of original beliefs without kind of the the conniving of shift and mostly ginger, honestly, here. Without that, they just kind of return to their old beliefs. Right. Yeah. That that was only a temporary thing. Mm-hmm. Well, and to be fair, uh to, <laughs> to the Clormen, they I mean, this really was never their idea to begin with. Right? They were learning right. about, I mean, think about Emeth just a few chapters ago. They were learning that, of course, you know, uh, according to these leaders, that Tash and Aslan were the same just a few hours ago. Like, this was brand new news to them. So, obviously, they fall back. Yeah, it's pretty easy. This is actually a pretty logical that. thing for them to do. Yeah. Um, and it seems like Tash is the only one doing anything to them from their perspective. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Aslan still hasn't showed up, right? And and we'll definitely talk about the fact that, I mean, here we are, chapter 12, the end of Narnia. We have not gotten a whiff of Aslan at all in this book. But that's not the conversation we're having right now. Let's The conversation we are having is here inside of the stable, Tyrion realizes that there's a strong light. He's blinking because the light is so strong. And the figure of Tash walks over and confronts not Tyrion, but confronts Rishta Tarkhan and asks him what he has to say. Right. He points out that Rishta is the one who called him. He says, here I am. And I love the description of Rishta's reaction. He was shaking like a man with a bad hiccup. At first, I, th- I had a little trouble picturing this, but then I thought, okay, if your whole body is convulsing from mm-hmm. a hiccup, this person is really nervous right now. And it also shows that we saw how brave he was in battle and it points that out. But half his courage had real, uh, had left him earlier that night when he began to suspect that there might be a real Tash. The rest of it had left him now. Yeah. And then he picks him up with one of his arms, right? And it takes him away. Yep. It takes him away. And as he turns to look at Tyrion, he is then banished by none other than High King Peter, who says, Be gone, monster, and take your lawful prey to your own place. In the name of Aslan and Aslan's great father, the emperor over the sea. And it just vanishes. Tash just vanishes. It's not like he runs away. It says He's he vanishes with the gone. Tarkon under, still under his arm. And Tyrion, he turns to see who's spoken. And then he sees the seven kings and queens staring before him. What's happening to you reading this for the first time? Well, similar to what's happening to Tyrion, it set my heart beating as if it had never beaten in any fight. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, it, it was a, that's a, an incredible reveal. Reading this for the first time, you know, and I didn't know what was going to be in the stable. Mm -hmm. I thought it might be Tash. I thought it could be something else. But then to have everybody show up, it's a heroic moment. And we're in chapter 12. So this has been building up for a long time, but it connects enough because we saw everybody in a vision or a dream early on. So this is now reconnecting to that. Mm -hmm. And the timing is incredible because they're losing a battle. It feels like a really nice cinematic moment. It's a great moment here. He looks, he first notices Jill. Interesting. Jill's the first he notices. We didn't even see what happened to Jill in this battle. Like The last we saw of Jill, she was running towards these spears and fighting, and then we don't see her again until we now see her here. It, it Lewis writes that uh, it's not as Jill as he had last seen her with her face all dirt and tears and an old drill dress half slipping off one shoulder. Now she looked cool and fresh, as fresh as if she had just come from bathing. And at first he thought she looked older, but then didn't. And he could never make up his mind on that point. He then goes on, he sees Eustace, and he can start to make out who these other people are. And he notices himself. He's a little worried. Well, I'm not dressed appropriately. And he looks down, and he's not covered in blood or dust. He realizes he himself is in the nicest clothes that he would have worn as Lewis writes, at a great feast. Hmm. What What about Tyrion? So you, you said that yeah, maybe these other people had already been here. Tyrion, we, we followed his point of view in here. Right. What happened? So this is, this is part of what makes me wonder, 
did it was Jill killed and then goes here or did she get pushed in after and then time just doesn't matter when you get pushed through the stable door? I'm so curious. Yeah. But what are, what are you specifically asking about Tyrion? I'm just wondering even just the, the change of clothes for him. Why, you know, th- would that make sense then if they're dead? Would it be this or is it just some kind of uh, not dead but not alive either? I'm thinking of, I'm, what is it? I'm th- the, the Princess only Bride. <laughs> no, I'm not thinking of Princess Bride. We're He's only mostly dead. <laughs> and mostly dead is still a little bit alive. <laughs> he said, too blame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, so good. <laughs> Which... <laughs> That that movie just gets better the more I watch it. I don't I don't When was the last time you watched it? Uh twenty twenty October. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's weird that you know like the exact month. It uh, was because I, I convinced the people I was hanging out with to get Disney Plus in oh, order for okay. us to watch it. We watched it on a laptop yeah, screen. Yeah. <laughs> That's is that um who is the uh, it's Billy Crystal. Billy Crystal. It's Billy Crystal. Yeah. That's what it is. Which means to bluff. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, there's nothing better than true love. <laughs> Except, of course, the nice MLT when the mutton is real lean. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we should do a podcast about that. I can't believe it's been seven seasons since we've... I don't think we've ever mentioned The Princess Br- Bride before. And I feel like that's something I quote regularly as oh. every... Absolutely, person all the time. does. You know, <laughs> I uh, don't know, suppose you could hurry it up. <laughs> the what were we even talking about at this point? Oh, I don't being know. Let's just dead. switch to the I, Princess Bride. I also was thinking of the weird uh, spoilers for Harry Potter, but that weird kind of King's Cross that Harry Harry goes to in Deathly Hallows, where he's not dead, but he's also not like completely alive. He's kind of sent back mm-hmm. into the world after that. Is that, I mean, that would maybe, I mean, it's because that's not even a purgatory because he's not dead. At least I don't think he was dead. I've only read that book once, so I yeah. could be wrong. But um, Or maybe it's like The Matrix Reloaded where he's in the in-between place. No one understands what you're talking about <laughs> now. You can't, you can't pull from that. And it, the, I do remember the architect scene. I remember that. Yeah. I remember the weird twins. Yep. How is it that Princess Bride has never come up? But it, I would say at least every season, The Matrix Reloaded has, has come into the conversation for this podcast, which un, undeservedly so. That movie does not deserve anyone to speak about it ever again. I just think you should. Have you, when was the last? I know we're not supposed to talk about this anymore, but when was the last time you really sat down and watched and used a thesaurus I, <laughs> to look up what all the or a dictionary to look up what all the words meant. Oh, I thought you were to look up what reloaded meant. I'm like, I think I had a pretty decent understanding of what that meant. Uh, I got the movies in. I, I checked out Reloaded and Revolutions from the library. Wow! So it must have been. So you watched I had them to have been in high school in order to have been able to go check them out. Yeah. Right. At right. Seventeen or eighteen, I guess. Yeah. Rated R. Yeah, I would. Have, I guess I would have had to have been a, a junior, or senior in high school. Yeah, the only that's the only time I saw. I watched both those movies one time and never again. I watched a great courses lecture about the Matrix. The Matrix. No, you did not. I did. They have and a great courses for the Matrix. No, they have a they have one about science fiction and philosophy. That makes more sense. And it's actually I don't I don't super love. I've only watched like four or five. I don't super love the the message behind them because. It's, it's very anti-faith, but I did think there were some really interesting points. The about, Matrix movie or the Great Courses? Uh, the Great Courses, lex- this the guy who's doing the, this particular, he's doing series. all the lectures on okay. the sci-fi and philosophy stuff. I really did appreciate some of the things he was talking about with the Matrix, and he said if you really slow down and you watch this and you look up, if you could even like go through the script and look it up, and the architect scene is, it sounds like complete, you know, just. Mm-hmm. baloney but if you actually pay attention to it there's some really interesting stuff there yeah but it's kind of like uh the prequels where there's some really great ideas maybe not the best execution that could have happened yeah that, i guess i mean i'll take your word for it <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm just glad that these conversations are recorded now because in five years we can i'm pull not this saying back. i i could easily find myself being the kind of person who even just for the sheer joy of arguing would take this if I went back and rewatched them. Even if I didn't love them, would just like being like, no, no, you guys are missing out. It's great, you know. Yeah. I like doing that. It, you know it's a that. great movie for that. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's go back to these conversations that begin to happen between Tyrion 
and the rest of the people here. Uh, we see Jill says, "We're gonna. In- I'm gonna introduce you to Peter." Uh, Tyrion uh, recognizes each of the kind of the people as they come. We get to see the Polly. We see Diggory, Edmund, and and Lucy. And as you know, Tyrion is shaking their hands and meeting them. Uh, he he asks. He realizes. Wait, weren't there two sisters? And then we we get this. My sister Susan, answered Peter shortly and gravely, is no longer a friend of Narnia. Yes, said Eustace, and whenever you've tried to get her to come and talk about Narnia or do anything about Narnia, she says, what wonderful memories you have. Fancy you still thinking about all those funny games we used to play when we were children. Oh, Susan, said Jill, she's interested in nothing nowadays except nylons and lipstick and invitations. She was always a jolly sight too keen on being grown up. <laughs> grown up indeed, said the Lady Polly. I wish she would grow up. She wasted all her school time wanting to be the age she is now, and she'll waste all the rest of her life trying to stay that age. Her whole idea is to race on to the silliest moment of one's life as quick as she can, and then stop there as long as she can. And then Peter changes the conversation, and that is the end of this chapter. Yeah. And I think we should have most of this conversation now, despite the fact that we still you're still unclear as to where they really are mm-hmm. and what is really happening. The conversation about what happened to Lucy? Well, uh, Susan, or Susan? But yes. Uh, I will tell you, Susan, I, when he, I even used the search feature here uh, in the Kindle app. This is the end of Susan. Her name does not appear for the rest of the book. Wow. So that's it. That Susan's story is done. Man. Yeah. Knowing that Susan's name will not appear another time in this book. So whatever happens next almost doesn't matter because Susan isn't included in it yeah. one way or the other. Well, I mean, were you surprised to find Susan left out from... She's she's not a friend of Narnia anymore is, is maybe the language we want to use here. Yeah. I have an interesting perspective on this because who played... Susan and the uh, Walden Media. We are not the right people to ask. For Anna. This. Oh, 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 Pop, Anna. Popwell. Pop, Popwell. Pop, oh, Popwell. You talk, and I'll look it up to make sure we get it right. There, when I was, I was looking up something about Narnia a long time ago, and there was an article on the side about Popwell. Ha- Popwell. Mm-hmm. There was an article on the side about Anna Popwell discussing why Lucy wasn't. Sorry, why Susan, the character Susan, was not a part of Narnia anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time thought maybe it was a, this is why we didn't make any more movies, but now it makes much more sense as a, so it wasn't a full surprise because it it connected to that. There was something, I feel like this, the it's, it's not common knowledge, but I mean, it's a pretty famous point of contention here in the Chronicles that Susan is excluded from the end of this series Mm -hmm. for whatever may come. Susan's not there anymore. And I also think outside of this, you and I had talked about the fact that there were seven. And you kind of count them up. And you're like, wait a second. Right. right. And everything's happened in pairs. Like mm-hmm. Noah's Ark. So what happened to, to <laughs> one of them? Well, there is a lot of tension and a lot of objections to Lewis's refusal. I don't know if that's really the right word. Lewis's omission of Susan here at the end of the Chronicles. And I want to read to you some of these objections because some of them are, they are some hot takes. Are these from the Goodreads account? These are uh, Neil Gaiman, J.K. Rowling, and Philip Pullman. So these are, uh, I don't think they're on Goodreads. I mean, their books are, but I don't know that they have an account. So here, here is, and I just read for anyone who, I know not everyone reads along with us. Did Pullman do the series that became the Golden Compass? Golden Atlas Compass. <laughs> yeah, he and he kind of wrote them as like the the anti Chronicles of Narnia. He has never really liked a lot of Lewis stuff, whereas um, I think both Rowling and Neil Gaiman seem to have somewhat of a respect for Lewis, even if they don't love a lot of all of his work. Hmm. Um, and I just read for I know some listeners don't always read each chapter along with us. It's totally fine. I read the exchange right there. So everyone's just heard exactly the words that are used here. I thought it'd be helpful to hear exactly what Lewis says or what Lewis writes 
in this chapter. So here's some of the things uh, that are some of the objections that come up about um, Susan's exclusion from Narnia. Neil Gaiman says, I found the disposal of Susan to be intensely problematic and deeply irritating. He even went on to write a short story about a professor who is supposedly a Susan, potentially, although I don't know if he actually ever names her. I've read it once, but I did not. I just went back and skimmed it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know that she's given a name, but I could be wrong. Sounds like a job for your Kindle search feature. But it's, uh, I didn't have, it's not on Kindle. Uh, I mean, I did read it on a Kindle. And, but it clearly is supposed to be her. And she's reading, um, it's this professor reading a student's essay on Susan. So it's kind of a little bit meta here, but it's really Neil Gaiman trying to come up with a, a better ending for Susan while also kind of airing, sharing his frustration and disappointment. J.K. Rowling takes it further. She says, There's a, there comes a point where Susan, who was the older girl, is lost to Narnia because she becomes interested in lipstick. She's become irreligious basically because she found sex. I have a big problem with that. And then Philip Pullman agrees with both of these two. He says, I just don't like the conclusions Lewis comes to. After all that analysis, the way he shuts children out from Narnia on the grounds that the one girl is interested in boys. She's a teenager. Ah, it's terrible, isn't it? Sex. Can't have that. So there you go. Some objections to Susan. She is, uh, again, the line from Jill is she's interested in nothing nowadays except nylons and lipstick and invitations. She always was a jolly sight too keen on being grown up. But I had to look up nylons. Did you know what they were? Um, to cover your legs with? Yeah, that's just like hose. I yes. didn't realize that's... that's well, just... you can't say that anymore. <laughs> uh, but that's what... I didn't know that's what it was. I was like... I was like, is it like a type of lipstick? Is it like... I, don't know. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't quite sure. I'm glad that you were... What else today. is made out of nylon? I don't know. Maybe yarn. Maybe I get you know, different things. I don't know what I thought it was. It also <laughs> like I know what nylon is, but I didn't know if it just like. There's a lot of things that British people use, like different phrases. <laughs> it doesn't like it like didn't mean it had to be my <laughs> nylon. Like it could have been something else. If you make a mistake, someone will say you should have used a rubber. <laughs> exactly <laughs> to yeah. erase it. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Let's uh, <laughs> let's move on. So I will start off by saying, as we talk about this, and we'll hear that your, was the first draft. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear. I want to get some of your thoughts on this. I'll share some of mine. I'll, I will say to kind of just take it a make it a little bit serious from it. You and I have consistently taken, or at least I shouldn't say taken. We have attempted to take a a relatively moderate approach when it's come to objections that are kind of placed upon Lewis and these chronicles. We did that starting all the way back in like maybe season three, but definitely by season five when we were introduced to the Kalormans at large. Kind of we acknowledged, you know, some of the objections that come across with Lewis's depictions of their culture that, you know, we said that we seemingly, it's you know, Lewis is attempting to create this culture akin to, you know, what we find in Arabian Nights or medieval literature. And that it, even though it's a mostly negative depiction, there are definitely heroes like Erebus and now Emeth that come out of that, right? But we've also said that that depiction does begin to slip into caricatures of, of Middle Eastern culture, right, in a few different instances. But we don't think that Lewis was being intentionally polemic, right, and that we've been careful to acknowledge that you and I are viewing this from a 21st century lens, mm-hmm. and, lens, and that can easily make us chronologically snobbish, which Lewis has often warned us against. Now, that's not the discussion we're having right now. I give all of that backstory to say that I think that you and I have usually tried to understand objections uh, to, to Lewis's work, even if we don't find them to be disqualifying from the overall merit of the books, mm-hmm. right? With that said... Uh, I had to admit, I find most of these arguments against Susan's exclusion on the basis of sexuality or her femininity to be almost entirely vapid. I, I, I just, I, it, I think it's a weightless argument, honestly. They seem really weak as arguments. And I'm try, I, I may not be objective here, but I, I feel like I'm trying to be very objective. I just don't, I don't see it. I think they're reading way too much into it and also i think the invitations part shows that it's not just that it's the entire social being an adult thing i don't i don't think it's just 
dating or just sex or anything. I think it's wanting to be an adult and to move on from this childhood fantasy realm. So honestly, I, I think when we look at this this argument here, I think I've tried to understand what the argument is. And I, I'd be interested to hear from readers too because um, I'm sure there are people who, who disagree with you and I. And this is not a conversation where you want to necessarily just completely shut down. I'm, I'm interested in hearing uh, other people's perspectives. But from what my understanding of this, and I, I read around, I read, like I said, I read, uh, I pulled those quotes from Rowling, from Pullman. I also read, I, I went on Goodreads. I'm not reading more Goodreads stuff, but I did go on there. I looked at some other kind of reviews uh, and other blog posts that people had read, Reddit posts. So, I mean, these are very like anecdotal, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to find people who are very frustrated um, with Susan's ending here in the Chronicles. And I think my understanding of the argument is there's, there's kind of two points. One, that Susan's exclusion is precipitous, right? It happens suddenly. It occurs out of nowhere. And then the second part is that it's done because Susan embraces her femininity. She embraces her adult sexuality, right? And what's interesting, and I wonder if some of this leads others into reading it this way, is that I, I do think, and we did this even way back in season one, when you were, at that time she wasn't even your girlfriend, but when you're now wife, right? When Sarah Jane came on the show and we talked about the Father Christmas line, uh, battles are... Oh, I don't remember the exact line, but battles are are like wrong when women. It's not wrong. I don't know what the <laughs> line is, but like battles become dirty when women are involved or something like that. I will. I'll, well, I'll look it up in a moment. But yeah, messy. Uh, yeah, it's something. And it's, it's a line. Very like, let's specifically worded. Let's let's talk through some of that. And there's legitimate conversations that we could bring up about Lewis's views on complementarianism. Uh, the role, like we said, of women in warfare. And even if you and I don't uh, agree with Lewis on all of those things, we can acknowledge that there might be some tension there. Even if you do agree with Lewis, if you hold, for instance, a complementarian view, or if you agree with um, some of his more traditional stances, there's, I think you still would acknowledge that there is some tension there for a modern reader. Yeah. Right? Battle, think, battles are ugly when women fight. Battles are ugly when women fight. Uh I think although I, I could, I think although I could easily be mistaken that these objections are Susan was excluded in the first place and that she was excluded because of sexuality. And I think if we want to address those two things, I think the first one, which is that she's excluded very hastily, that this isn't, you know, all of a sudden like, oh my goodness, Susan's not here. I think really... If you go back, I'm not sure that I would agree with that assessment. I think really since, honestly, the first book, she came across as caring, maternal. She was gentle. She was also controlling and a little bossy. And now, I mean, Edmund was a literal traitor, so don't don't make me sound like, well, yeah, 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 she was real bad. No, no. She was a great character, and you mm -hmm. and I both liked her a lot. But we saw that this I, this um, it's uh, it's not surprising that she would be maybe pulled to wanting to focus on social acceptance, mm -hmm. right? We see that in The Horse and His Boy, right? And even from Lucy's own thoughts in Don Treader, that Susan has always been a, a woman who's held in high regard by men. And we see that she has a harder time even believing in Aslan's appearance in Caspian. I went back to our... I didn't listen to the episode because we don't do that here. But <laughs> I went back to some of my notes from Caspian and you and I back when you used to actually make notes before the show, uh, which now I just, um, we used to write, write in the same document. I mean, I know you still prepare. That makes it sound yeah. like you don't prepare. But yeah. uh, when we made doc notes together, you and I had both made notes that we felt like Lewis was too harsh to Susan hmm. and Caspian, that we thought she was too much of, not an unbeliever, but was too slow to believe compared to the rest of the children. And that the way that she was described by the narrator was with a lot less grace than the other children got. This, or at least maybe mercy, if you want to look at it that way. That mm. Lewis was a lot more merciful in his, you know, the way he was depicting the other characters. And Susan, it was a little bit harsher with. So I'm not convinced that it's at all surprising that, that Susan would choose her world over Narnia. And I also, as an aside, and I'd love to know what your thoughts are, before we go into this, maybe this, this second part of these objections... 
Lewis is also the author, and I, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's an act of injustice for him to make any decision he wants to about a fictional character. Yeah, I mean, am I like I'm? I'm interested to know, like, am I being polemic in that when I when I describe it in that way, or do you think these assessments are relatively fair? Yeah, I. It's interesting, especially because those are three well-published authors now i'm curious when they made these statements they were mostly 90s and early 2000s okay so neil gaiman had been established as a comics writer since the late 80s oh they they were all established by this time like they're all famous people saying these things okay because i think rolling is saying it too i don't know if all the the potter books have been published but um it was i don't i don't have the dates in front of me anymore i'm sorry but it was uh, I went back to just Google real quick. Uh, C.S. Lewis, J.K. Rowling. I don't know why I thought that was going to help. Uh, first thing here, why is C.S. Lewis not as popular as J.K. Rowling? <laughs> 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 Let me read the answer. Now we just, uh, this is totally off topic. We got to read the answer here. They didn't have Scholastic uh, changing all the titles to things that Americans could understand. Uh, well, here's, here's a better, here's a more interesting question that comes up. I don't, it's on Quora which I never can understand where do you find the answers on these things. Yeah. I like to think I'm a decently intelligent guy, and I have no idea how you find an answer on this website. Yeah. Uh, or, or a source. <laughs> that's very true as well. Uh, th- this one was answered by uh, a guy who had just as underwords, English major with graduate work in literature and a lifetime of reading. That, that's the qualification. <laughs> Me too, man. <laughs> it's like, oh, good. I've, uh, I took some English classes in college. I think I'm, I'm yeah. pretty good at this. I've uh, been speaking it most of my life. <laughs> Going on 30 years. Uh, so sorry. So, so go back. I interrupted you as you were answering. We're having a, a little bit more of a serious conversation here. It's, it's one thing if uh, someone who has not published and has not gone through that process. Yeah, just like all said, the Goodreads articles that I skipped over. Right. Or reviews, whatever. And if they just say, oh, they shouldn't have you know, killed off this character, or shouldn't have done this, that that's one thing. But th- it's interesting that these are people who, this is their profession, you know, telling stories in published book form. Yeah, Gaiman's is so interesting to me because he says he founds the disposal of Susan to be intensely problematic, which I think from his perspective, I think he is talking about the same objections that Rowling and Pullman have, mm-hmm. but then deeply irritating. That's actually the more interesting part to me because Gaiman's a writer. Right. And I mean, he's, he's not only is he a writer, he's much more intelligent than you and I are and much more talented and has a better understanding of literature than we do. So I'm not trying to say, here's me literally sitting on my couch at home Monday morning quarterbacking his own, <laughs> you know, it's actually Monday too. Uh, yeah. It's not in the morning. It's not the morning. Can no. you imagine? Uh, I, I'd rather not. Uh, but I'm interested because I'm sure he's done things. He's the guy who wrote Sandman, right? Yeah. He's probably done things that have been deeply irritated. So it's interesting that he would go out of his way to make those comments. And not even, I'm legitimately saying not as a interesting and a judgmental way. It, it's interesting in an honestly interesting way. Yeah. I don't know what it's like. I'm not a writer at all, you know? I, I'm i curious if it is. I think I don't know about Pullman. I'm guessing he is not a Christian either. I'm curious if this is irritating because it is a character that they would be closer to, where maybe they have mm-hmm. had faith at some point and then walked away Interesting. from it. I really don't know. I don't, and I, I'm guessing on Gaiman, based on what I've read about him and, like, heard him say but i don't really know about rolling um at this point i I don't know where anybody's actual background when they made this quote is Mm -hmm. but i have a guess based on other things i know about them Uh, i'm curious if they don't like that that character is kind of them i'm curious if it's a Mm -hmm. i really like this character and you took it away you took this character away from me which i've felt before when a character is killed off that I really liked, but you know what irritates me even more than not having that character? It's having that character left in when there, like n- nothing was lost. If mm-hmm. there's if th- there's no sacrifice, there's no if everything works out perfectly for everyone in the end. That's great for books aimed at much younger kids. But yeah. I don't know. I I feel like I'm more irritated when there were no risks and no consequences in a story. Sure. Um, because you didn't want to kill your favorite character. You have to kind of kill your really good characters sometimes. And it, 
is whenever they do it, whenever they take like the character that has the most mystery, like when they killed off Snoke, I was like, whoa, they, I did not expect them to do that. And I didn't expect it to be final. Mm -hmm. And then they did. And then if they don't do it, if they keep bringing a character back who shall remain nameless, that it's kind of annoying. Oh yeah. Then nothing means anything. And I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting point too, because it does, you know, it, it gives a little bit of weight to the the story as well too because like oh someone's not here like there was there was a cost for this and it might be as simple and this is a spoiler alert for a movie that's almost 20 years old for uh joss whedon's serenity which is mm-hmm. the follow-up movie to firefly if you haven't seen firefly or serenity skip ahead like i don't know two minutes for this because i am going to spoil the ending here but i think it's i hadn't thought about this but it's important what do i do have you Oh, you, wait, have you not seen it? No. Oh, man. Well, now I can't I, say I've it. I've tried twice. You might as well just tell me. Okay, fine. So, um, I forgot that you don't like Firefly. We haven't... You're... No, no. I I do like Firefly. Every time someone says, we should, you should watch it, I say, okay, when? And then the conversation drifts off. It's 13 off. episodes, man. It's not a real big thing. It's commitment. not that... I, I, that's what I say. Well, I, I won't tell you which, which character this is, but... Is it uh, Summer Glau? What? Is it Summer Glau's character? No, it's not. Well, maybe Serenity. I don't know. You'll have to find out. Uh, the in the TV show, they didn't have the movie, and in, in the movie, uh, in the final battle, a fan favorite character is killed off hmm. very suddenly, and Joss Whedon had said, or maybe it was, I guess he probably did write it. Yeah, I, I'm assuming he's, he wrote it too. Um, that the reason for that was they knew the story was ending, just like here in the Chronicles of Narnia. And he said that that final battle had so much more stakes because you had just seen one character, a favorite, be killed off. And the idea is, as a viewer, as you're watching, you're like, well, if they're willing to do that, then no one is safe. Yes. Like, none of our yes. characters are safe. Like, earlier they had killed off a different character. They're like, oh, that's a bummer, but, yeah. you know, that's... I'm not super surprised by that. It's so frustrating when they kill off a character who may have just been introduced to give you a character that they can kill. Off. Yeah, but this this was when you're like, oh no, like I'm I'm horrified by this. And even to this day, one of the main reasons that I would never because I don't want to reboot anyways, but I don't want to reboot because if this character's not in it, I'm not interested. Yeah. And I want I always wonder if like is that part of the reason why they haven't rebooted? Because why mm. wouldn't you by now? Because everything gets rebooted these days. Yeah. But you'd be missing. A character, of, like one of the best characters in the show. And I wonder if some of that could be said about, you know, I, I don't know that Susan was as much of a fan favorite here, but her exclusion here makes you go, oh my goodness, they're like, they're, there's a cost here. And are, you know, am I safe? I don't think you're asking, are any of the other characters safe? But what does that mean for you to have been a friend and have not been? Is this a proposal for salvation? Is it not? We'll have to find out. Uh, and I think there's more to talk about that when we get to the very end of the book. Yep. But I do also want to move on and, and address this second idea, uh, which is that you know, that I don't know that Gaiman addresses as much, or at least I didn't see as much of this, but that both Pullman and Rowling heavily allude to by naming, I mean, Rowling just says, she's become irreligious basically because she found sex. And I want to go through this. I am... Not sure that finding nylons, lipstick, and makeup, to me, these were common stand-ins for, they're not inherently bad things at all, but they could be a common stand-in for kind of shallow things that a mid-century patriarchal society would have placed upon Susan, right? Whether Mm -hmm. you like them or not, you better be dressing like this, you better look like this, right? But it's not to say they're inherently bad, but they also could easily be placed upon her. And that's some of the sense I've always gotten with Susan is that some of this, you know, the kind of this, you know, being the um, the kind of the the girl of the family who's kind of shown off and paraded about, right, is is often placed upon her. But I don't think that has necessarily, and while those are directly related to uh, her femininity, I don't think they're necessarily related to her sexuality, right? And as we've talked about many times on the show, it, so many things that are important in life are about your ordering of things. Like, there's a lot of very good things that if they become the most important thing are now a bad thing. Right. And Lewis literally uses the phrase, nothing, well, Lewis doesn't, Jill says, she's interested in nothing nowadays except 
nylons, lipstick, and invitations. Not she likes those things. Right. And I think really and truly, if it just said she's interested in nylons and lipsticks and invitations, I think I would agree that that's like that does come across as a relatively sexist comment, right? Yeah. Or as a relatively like wow, like you know, upholding a kind of a very patriarchal structure here. But uh, when you introduce the word accept, it shows that it is in the place of everything else. Exactly. And this is one of the things that I think is most difficult to communicate as a Christian to a non-Christian or a secular audience mm -hmm. is that all it could be a long list of things, but all these things are not bad. And that is not the message that, that is being spoken to us. It is those things being the top priority or being in place of God. That's when it's incorrect. Yeah, I, it's, I think what is really occurring here is that Susan has chosen shallow social acceptance and perpetual adolescence, right? And I think it's important that it's those teenage years. I mean, that's the line that then Polly has, right? I wish she would grow up. She wasted all of her time wanting to be the age she is now, and she'll waste all the rest of her life trying to stay that age. Now, I also went and I looked up uh, Susan's age here. Now, again, this is Narnia Webb um, is pulling these from some of Lewis's um, notes wor work itself, right? So Susan should be right now about 21 years old. So we're not talking 14 years old. Mm -hmm. We're talking a young adult here. And what's interesting, though, is we think about those adolescents, I would really say, in, but in that 15 to 25 range, I know that that's moving into young adult, obviously. But what's interesting about that is by that often those years can be more focused on, like we've just heard, social acceptance and appearing older. And often, maybe this is just anecdotal because I know I absolutely did this and I knew you during this time, so you also did this too, is that we don't act more mature to be older, we just try to downplay being younger, hmm. right? We try to downplay our imaginations. We try to downplay our childlike wonder. We downplay all the actual really good things about being young, the things that Jesus actually commends us to be like, yeah. right? And we downplay those things without actually being more mature. Right. I think that's Susan's problem here. It's that she's focused on those things, right? And... and for all we know, it could have been uh, Eustace, right, who all of a sudden has fallen back into his old ways, and he's no longer invited, and we find out he's focused more and more about his, uh, you know, he could easily be kind of a keeping up with the Joneses kind of guy. Think about him and these marks that he cared so much about. He never studied any subject for its own sake, but he just liked marks, and he asked, would ask people, what mark did you get and what did you get, right? Mm -hmm. He could easily be the guy that it doesn't matter what car he drives as long as it's better than his neighbor's car, Right? And I think that's the kind of thing that Susan has just fallen back into, right? I think Joseph Pierce actually says this really well. I pulled a little bit from his book further up and further in. He, he writes this. He says, Polly's words warrant our particular attention because they serve as a criticism not merely of Susan, but of the entire modern culture of the, or entire culture of the modern world. We live in a world that idolizes the follies and fantasies of the pubescent adolescent, an age in which maturity is spurned and derided, an age in which adults are not only outnumbered but outgunned by those who refuse the challenge of truly growing up. He then uh, goes on to say this. It should evoke feelings of pity in those of us who are grown-ups, or in those of us who are at least trying to be grown-ups, towards those who are trying their damnedest not to grow up. We should pity those who are seeking romantic love incessantly, he put love in quotation marks here, and therefore unsuccessfully, and who are forever shrinking the responsibilities of true adulthood, not least of which is the acceptance of sacrificial of the self-sacrificial demands of marriage and raising children. Now, obviously, that's not something that everyone does, mm -hmm. marriage and raising children. I would add on to Pierce's thing that I think there's many other self-sacrificial things as an adult but that's a big part of it right like a big yeah. part of being an adult right is being sacrificial well we also serve a god who was the most sacrificial so growing up does mean becoming more christ-like and less centered on ourselves and we know that that's exactly what susan hasn't become right it's all about her it's all about her exactly yeah. it's invitations 
Who am I? Who is who is inviting me to these things? I'm I'm reminded of a quote that I know very well because it's another one of the catechisms my students say every morning. It comes from Saint Augustine, and I often ask them um, a couple of different questions, but I also ask them why do we study the good, the true? Like, what's the purpose of studying things that are good, things that are true, and things that are beautiful? And we quote from Saint Augustine, it's from On Christian Doctrine, where he says, "I'm not going to say all of it, but." He says, we, you know, living a just and holy life requires one to love things in the right order. And he goes on, he gives like all these lists, and the lists are very, very confusing mm-hmm. um, unless you read them very slowly. He's like, so that you don't love what is not to be loved or fail to love what is to be loved or have a greater love for something that should be loved less or a lesser love for something that should be loved more or an equal love for things that sh- for something that should be less or more or loving something for less or more that should be loved equally. I'm paraphrasing. And I, I share this quote from Augustine because I think by leaving her out of Narnia here and by doing so for what appears to be relatively shallow reasons on her part, he does remind us about what's important. And this goes back to that line I mentioned about the dwarves. At the very beginning of this chapter, we said the dwarves were many things, but you, you know, they're absolutely, they were absolutely still brave, right? You couldn't say they weren't brave. And while I think that's a compliment, I think actually bravery is a virtue, courage is a virtue, but it's not the most important virtue, right? And if someone can only say that you're brave, but they can't say that you are sacrificial or that you have self-control or that you are forgiving or loving, or generous, or we just go, then go through all the, you know, through the Spirit, right? If you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? All of these things, but you're brave. Like, I'd actually say that's not how I would want to be described, right? Courage is a good thing. It's not the best thing. Yeah. And I think it's a similar kind of idea with the dwarves that we see here. It's not that, you know, it's not that it's wrong for Susan to go out and wear makeup. And wear lipstick, but it's wrong if that's her main reason for living. In the same way that it's not wrong for me to love many of the things that I love, but if they became first loves, well, now it's a very big problem. And like you said, this is sometimes going to be really hard to explain to other people. And you were talking about, in particular, non Christians. I think it's hard for me to even explain to myself, for yeah. me to understand. I have a tendency to always overreact. I mean, we hear this on the show in very silly ways when I overreact, but like in very. St- uh, non-serious but serious or non-silly but serious ways i can have react to oh man this thing was too much of a uh this thing was maybe too much of a temptation to like focus too much on my phone or to focus too much on my work and so i need to completely cast that out of my life right. like, no, no no i just need to actually re- order my loves appropriately it doesn't mean i need to completely do this. I was the yeah. kind of kid that heard you're supposed to cut your left hand off if it causes you to sin. I thought, well, that just means literally get rid of everything ever that causes me to sin. Realizing that, uh, not realizing as a child that a lot of what caused me to sin was just a misordering of loves. Hmm. Not that those things were inherently bad. There are actual bad things out there. Makeup's not one of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, I have a, a similar overreaction, especially with uh, any technology type of thing. I need to get rid of all the electronics. Mm-hmm. And it it just, one, it's not true, but also it, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> so it, it can be very quickly become a distraction in its own right. You start to mm-hmm. idolize like focus or purity or whatever it is. I we We have learned a ton from listener emails. Yeah. And I, it's the kind of thing where, where else would we have gotten that? Oh, absolutely. If people didn't write it in and say it. So, And yeah. I hope that always whenever we, and we tried to do this too, and we went through uh, Horse and His Boy in particular, that we always come across, I hope that we come across humbly and that we, again, are still Narnia novices and we're absolutely novices when it comes to dynamics of gender <laughs> and sexuality, right? And um, literary criticism. And so it, it, it could be I, that I am these two arguments that I've said, which is that Susan's exclusion comes out of nowhere and it's done just on the basis of her embracing more traditionally feminine things. I think I've kind of shared how I, how, how I understand that argument. But, you know, if there's someone else says, no, 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 that's not the argument, it's this, feel free to write into us or call into us and let us know because I, I'd be interested to hear. That was the the research that I had done. But again, I mean, I'm doing research with 
two young kids at home and also a full-time job. So it's not like it's the most intense research. And there could be someone else who's able to share these objections in a, in a very articulate way that maybe would be revealing to you and I. So I'd love to hear from listeners. And I'd also would say that Lewis himself has a little bit more to tell us. And there's some great, I think I mentioned that this summer I read his letters to children, and he actually answers some questions about Susan Ooh. in that. But we can't get to it yet because we've got to finish the book first. But we'll definitely make sure there's some time to go through some of those. Any final thoughts? I know I've done most of the talking, which usually it's a little bit more of a back and forth, but it also was harder for you because you didn't know this was coming, and I did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, my, my main thought on this piece that is about Susan is that I think that it is the piece that, yes, I think if I were coming in fresh, I would be upset that Susan was not included. I definitely get where these mm-hmm. other authors are coming from in their statements. I just think that it it is the it's the piece of the story that makes everything mm-hmm. fit together and it completes the supposal. it It makes everything connect. It, because if everything just ended up perfectly, it it wouldn't hit the same way, and it wouldn't mm-hmm. it wouldn't have the same lessons for me and the same kind of warnings, I guess. Yeah. So it's one of those pieces where it's like, yeah, that character had to die. That that's just how the the story is going. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, so you you think Susan's dead? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you said she they, they had to die. I, I'm thinking of other stories where okay. like a character sacrifices themselves or they're all yeah, of course you wish that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. But I think this character was quote sacrificed in a way in for the story, mm-hmm. even though the character itself didn't die. Um I just think it's this piece that you don't necessarily expect it, but it does make sense based on the other things we've read in the story. At, all seven chronicles together it yeah. fits with susan's character i would, i do wish it didn't happen but i think that's kind of the point you want to be left with that feeling of mm-hmm. that regret that she's not also i feel like we it's time to let the the feedback roll in <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll have more <laughs> good 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 more material and ammunition well let's uh let's let's wrap up here next time Phil, we've got some special guests joining us for the next chapter. Chapter 13 will be where we're going next. That is how the dwarfs refuse to be taken in. Aslan in this chapter appears finally to the seven friends of Narnia. It's been a while. We've missed him. Yep. Well, before we go, we actually have a voicemail here. You always say you like voicemail, so I picked out one for us today. You say it too. I do too. Uh, but I was also the one who chose it. So we've got a little voicemail here about Puzzle. I'll put it back in. I'll drop it in. I, I can't hear it. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kate, for that voicemail. So, Phil, Kate's argument here that Puzzle's level of culpability here is in line with just really the rest of the Narnians or Talking Beasts who all fell for the same trick, right? Mm-hmm. Do you, what do you think about this? It, it reminds me of how all sin is bad. And sure, they, they, different things have different consequences, but it's all... Mm-hmm. sin and we've all sinned so we're we're all guilty and i love i, I just love the word culpable mm-hmm. <laughs> the culpability um i feel like this makes a lot of sense 
and it's interesting that it wasn't addressed more with the other the other talking beast that fell for things i almost i i don't know that here in the story we've even had time to address it i mean when would that have happened the only time there's a confrontation occurs when Tyrion shows up at the stable and everybody's through the state like we're we're through the stable door hours later right and there's just no time for that to happen and during that time a lot of people are dying i wonder if it happening to one character stands in for the rest of them hmm. we get to zoom in on that one character and see how i love they're not necessarily worse but they're they're the one that's they're the ones that they're the one that represents the others i i don't necessarily disagree with kate here but I think it's a fun exercise, like a mental exercise to think through, okay, so let's let's say Puzzle is, the, is equally guilty of the talking beast. Well, the talking beast, the rest of them at least, wouldn't have had the ability to be guilty if it wasn't for Puzzle's actions, is, is, was my first response in hearing this. And mm-hmm. what I'm wondering too, because Kate brought up our own guilt, Right in our own sin, like she says, you know, we um, we have a level of guilt through ignorance, and like you you can be guilty through ignorance, even like outside of out of Christian society. Like there is such a thing of being, you know, I don't. There's got to be some better like actual legal word for it. But you can be, you can't just claim innocence for everything, right? right? Um, think about this is a horrible thing, but we in in the world of education and social services, like this is something that happens with with parents. Like there's certain things. Right, that parents can't be like, well, I just didn't know this was happening to my kid. I'm like, well, actually, that's not good enough. Right, right. Um, you're responsible. You have a responsibility, and this is true of us as Christians. We can't just simply claim ignorance, especially if we're already believers. Well, I, I didn't realize that, or I didn't know that. Right, and I do the same thing for my own children. Right, both my my children here at home, but also students at school. That there are some things you still can be ignorant of, but you're still held accountable. And like, well, now you know. And now you need to do that. And let's right. don't now you're now you are ignorant no more. So you yes. can't use that one anymore. So here's a here's a good Latin phrase for a school. Okay. Uh, a private school a private Christian school. Great. Uh, perhaps. Ignorantia juris non excusat. Okay. Uh, ignorance of the law ex- excuses not. <laughs> oh, well, there you have it. There's some Latin here on the show. Uh beautifully said. <laughs> not really, but that's not okay. Really. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a dead language, man. <laughs> Um, for a reason. The <laughs> it's, all right, it's, I'm moving on. <laughs> but so so now, now you've got me off of Kate's voicemail here. <laughs> I I think what's interesting is from Kate's at least as far as I understand Kate's argument here is the talking bee shouldn't be fooled, and that I'm I'm intrigued by this. I want to keep. I want to like sit with this idea a little bit longer. That you know, um, Obi Wan Kenobi. Oh, here we oh, go. Oh, oh, Master of Wisdom says. Uh, do you, you know what line I'm going to? When they're on board the Millennium Falcon and they open up the the compartments they've been hiding into, right? And Han Solo makes a comment. This is in A New Hope. And Han Solo makes Han Solo makes a comment that you know they were. He never thought he'd be smuggling himself in these, right? And Obi-Wan said, or excuse me, Ben Kenobi mm-hmm. in this moment says, who's the more foolish, the fool or the fool who follows him? <laughs> uh, which I do love that line. It's a great line. Um, and I think there's actually some wisdom here for the Narnians, for the talking beasts, which is that, you know, oh, something I had not considered is like all of these people fall for this to be Aslan, despite the fact that every single thing that is being done is things that Aslan would never do. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, like, in this understanding, Puzzle and the Talking Beast would both be guilty, but maybe of different things, maybe to different even degrees, but they're both equally guilty of having broken, you know, the Narnian law or whatever. I'm talking law, like capital L spiritual law here, right? Um, not, not civic law. Oh, that's great, Kate. Thanks so much for sharing this. This is that was really yeah, fun. Thanks I love for that calling thought. in. Well, Phil, I talked a lot 
today, especially about Susan. So would you like to go ahead and read the end credits for us? Sure. Past the glowing rectangle over here. This episode is made possible by our patrons over at patreon.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can listen to a bonus episode each month, along with other rewards. Special thanks goes to John Marr, Emily Wakefield, Ryan Smith, Ashlyn Washburn, and Ander Trophy for supporting us at our top tiers. Do you have any listener feedback? You can email us at thenarniapodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 406-646-6733. You can also find all of our previous episodes, links, and book information at lamppostlistener.com. A review on Apple Podcasts would help other people find the show and join our read-through. Thanks for coming along on this journey, and we will be back next time with Chapter 13.